Thanks for coming to this uh, third introductory lecture of the Probe Cost Action, so uh, kindly organized by the Working Group One Chairs, so Simone Kotos and Henri Demos. Uh, my name is Pauline Martinet, and I'm a scientist at Meto France, and I'm also the Working Group Two Chair, so I will try to introduce this uh, new lecture today. Um, so first of all, maybe some of you don't know exactly what is the cost actions. I think it has already been reminded in the previous lectures, but I will go quickly. So the co cost actions are intergovernmental framework um, research uh, funding actions by Europe so that we can cooperate in science and technology between the different members in Europe. So, Cost Actions coordinates the efforts led by nationally funded research product, projects so that different scientists in different countries can all together uh, collaborate uh, between each other and to enhance research and innovations in Europe. So there are quite a lot of different members, like for our Cost Action, we have 38 Cost members, but we also have partners in different uh, closing neighbor countries, but also um, uh, all over the world uh, in, in the United States or, or South Africa. Or, so we can have partners also, even if the cost action is driven by UAP uh, funding. So the, the motivation of the ongoing prop cost actions um, that you might already know too, is that the atmospheric boundary layer, so the ABL, is the single most undersampled part of the atmosphere. So it means that in our operational networks nowadays, we clearly have um, an observation gap in this part of the atmosphere, the closest to the surface. And we know that this part of the atmosphere is very important for meteorology, for air quality, aviation, and renewable energy. So this is why the atmospheric uh, boundary layer was selected as an incubation target uh, in, in, and this is part of the National Research uh, Council report of the United States. And there was a clear recommendation to implement programs to accelerate, accelerate the readiness of high priority observables. And in the top of priority atmospheric variables that we know we should have more in our future networks, um, we have identified at least three of them, but may, maybe more, but at least three, which are wind profiles, temperature and humidity profiles, specifically in cloud areas and cloud profiles. So we know we have this challenge to meet. So how we can, uh, um, we can ensure these needs. So this is one of the aim of the uh, probe cost action, which is to close the ABL observation gaps that we observe at a cost effectively uh, um, for Europe and at a European scale to have homogenization in our networks and to, to be able to, um, to coordinate these efforts. So we have four different working groups in the prop cost actions. One is about knowledge exchange. And this is uh, how we, thanks to this working group, we organize these um, introduction lectures so that we can speak to uh, users of instruments and also end users that are interested to know the products we could have. And we have three other working groups which are a bit more technical, but one is focusing on the um, advanced ABL profiling products. One is um, focusing on uh, measurement networks. And the last one is focusing on the operation and data quality of each instrument together. And this, of course, all working groups are all very close to each other, really related to each other, so that at the end, we can provide um, different algorithm and um, um, measurement techniques so that we could have uh, more uh, homogenized uh, European networks of valuable observation in this ABL, uh, in the atmospheric boundary layer. So, so just as a reminder, we already had two probe introductory lectures. One was about ground-based remote sensing instruments in May this year, and we also had one uh, lecture about specifically 
um, the, well, I think I, I said something wrong. I will say that again. The first one was about ground-based remote sensing networks. So, so what kind of networks you can find if you're interested in European scale networks. And also the second one in April was about really the instruments measuring uh, atmospheric boundary layer with their different techniques. So if you're interested in these two topics specifically, I really recommend you to go to the um, probe uh, a website where you can find the different uh, information. So first of all, there is the YouTube podcast uh, channels. So all the previous presentation were recorded and you can find the previous presentation. So you have a lot of information on these two topics, the networks and the instruments at the moment. And you can also go to the, I would recommend you to go to the uh, probe website, user space, where you can also have all the PDF of each presentation that we have done so far. And I'm sure you can find very valuable information for the topics you are interested in. So today, um, it's mainly we will mainly uh, discuss about uh, advanced ABL profiling. So the different products you could be interested in, especially if you are uh, an end an end users. Um, uh, so uh, there. We have organized the meeting so that we can divide the topics. So today, this is a part one. So we will mainly discuss about temperature and humidity profilings, wind and turbulence products, aerosols products, and cloud and precipitation products. And uh, the 9th of December, 2021, so between the same, the same hours, so 3 to 4.30 uh, p.m. Central European time, we will discuss more about forecast indices, fog alerts, icing alerts, and atmospheric boundary layer height and classification. So please, if you are interested in these topics, already save the date and book the date on the agenda for the part two. And today we will only focus on the part one. So I will first start with the temperature and humidity profiling. Then you will have so an overview, as I said, about the wind and gusts by Marcus Kaiser from DWD in Germany. The aerosol products will be presented by Hugo Ricketts from the University of Manchester. And we will have a presentation about the discrimination of aerosols, cloud, and precipitation in the observation by Ivona Staszlowska from the University of Warsaw in Poland. And I hope I didn't say spell, I didn't spell wrongly some names. Sorry for that if I did it. So this was for the introduction. So thanks a lot again for joining this uh, third introduction, introductory probe lectures. And I think I will right away, right away move to the, to the last part. I just have to remind you a few things for the questions. So um, if we have enough time, there will be some uh, minutes for questions after the presentation. So to that end, you should... Um, use uh, the pad link that Henri has sent to the Zoom chat. So there should be the pad link. So we prepare the pad link so that you can directly put your question in this chat. If you are not, if you cannot access the link or if you don't know how to access the link, you can also use the Zoom chat directly to put your questions, but please use the chat or the pad, make more the pad in priority if you can. Um, so it's because we can, uh, have the material even after the presentation, that's a bit better. But please put your question there, raise your hands on the Zoom, and uh, we will moderate the questions um, if we have time after each presentation, but also at the end of the all the presentation, we hope to have a 20 minute time of discussion, so there will be time. So thanks for joining. So we use the chat, um, the Zoom chat and the pad uh, in priority for your questions. And I think I will start now right away for the temperature and humidity profiling. So I will discuss uh, in this uh, first, intro first presentation about the different products you can, uh, you can have access to depending on different instruments. And uh, also I will mainly focus on the application, how these products are useful. I would like to thank all the contribution I received from my uh, colleagues from the other, other research laboratories, which are experts of other techniques than mine, and who helped me a lot to, uh, to have um, um, a fair and honest comparison between the different products I will show today. So mainly Domenico Cimini, Alexander Eflo, Christine Knist, Ulrich Lonert, and then Mariani. So thanks a lot. And thanks to all the probe temperature and humidity profiling subgroup. Uh, who contributed by their research uh, to this presentation too. 
So about this profile, so if you're interested to get temperature and humidity profile, the first thing I would like to let you know, especially if you are an end user, is that um, different instruments can provide you the same product, a profile, but they will have different drawbacks and advantages that can be uh, interesting to know because um, one instrument can be preferred over another one depending on the application, in fact. So we have three types of families of instruments. The first one is the passive instrument here on the left. I will mainly talk about the infrared spectrometer and the microwave radiometers. We have also the active instruments, which are um, an active optically based uh, technology. So we have, uh, which produce prop I will produce pulse laser radiations and measure the backscattering from aerosols and molecules to get you the information on the temperature and the humidity. Contrary to the passive instruments, which measure the naturally emitted downwelling radiation in the atmosphere, and this radiation is directly linked to atmospheric properties like the temperature and water group. So in the active instruments, I will mainly talk about dial for dif differential absorption lidars and Raman lidars. And we have now a new technology coming, which is that you, I'm sure you know it. It's the uncrewed IR vehicles or systems, so UAV, UAS, whatever you want to name them, which um, can provide a direct in situ measurement, like a bit like a radio sonics. And they all provide temperature and humidity profilings. But how, what are the differences? It's mainly in, I think the choice of the instrument and the product you would like to use will depend, of course, on your application. So if we go for the passive instruments, for example, one main advantage is that they don't have a blind zone. So when we talk about a blind zone, I will not go into the details, but it's just that in the active technology in general, there is a, a small part of the atmosphere close to the surface in which we can't make measurements or we cannot make accurate measurements. And these, um, and this part of the atmosphere that we cannot uh, really measure, make good measurements, uh, it depends in fact of each instrument characteristics. And in passive instruments, which don't, does not emit an, uh, um, uh, a laser wave, uh, you, can, uh, you don't have this, this drawback, for example. So you can measure from the surface up to the maximum altitude range without any blind zone. They have also a good uh, high temporal resolutions for the microwave radiometer only, they have an all sky capability and can penetrate cloud, which is uh, very uh, interesting if you're interested in clouds or fog, for example, study. And for microwave, we also have a high number of commercial units. So it's an important point if you're interested in networks. And for the infrared radiometer, uh, spec infrared sorry, spectrometer, what we can say is that uh, you can have higher vertical resolution compared to the microwave, for example. For the drawbacks of these instruments, there is no retrievals during rain, and there is quite, in fact, uh, low vertical resolutions. And for the infrared spectrometer, there is no observation above clouds and few commercial units in Europe. If we look now at the uh, UAVs, uh, they provide high vertical resolution, they provide high accuracy measurements and all sky measurements. But the main, the main drawbacks will be the limited altitude range depending on flight regulations and the limited flying time because these systems are not yet fully automated. Whereas, for example, the first instrument I discussed, the passive one, can really make measurements uh, during long time periods without any human um, person involved. For the active instruments, so the LiDAR technology, so many the dial and uh, the Raman LiDAR, they have a high vertical resolution and a high temporal resolution, and in fact, a higher accuracy compared to passive instruments. Um, for the dial, it provides a direct water vapor profiling techniques. Um, and for the, it, for the dial only, it's also a self-calibrating technology, which is important if you are thinking about future networks, for example. And both instruments can make measurements during light rain, which can be also interesting depending on your activities. The main drawbacks, it's again that we don't have cloud penetration. So it's like the infrared, it's totally absorbed by, this, by the cloud. So we cannot retrieve any information above the cloud. Um, there is an incomplete overlide, overlap, sorry. So it, this is what I try to explain about the blind zone. So depending on the instruments, you might not be able to uh, get information between 50 meters and uh, up to, to, let's say, 200 meters above the surface. So 
in this uh, vertical wedge, you might not get uh, measurements. There are still few commercial units available in Europe. And um, depending on the instrument specification, the Raman line does, we can say that sometimes it cannot produce accurate observation during the day because of low signal to noise ratio. Uh, for the dial, I want to precise that it only gives you humidity profiles and not temperature. And it can be important if you need both profile together. So for the product main characteristics, so here it's a table. I'm not sure I will go through it now, uh, honestly, because it's a lot of information. Um, it's really made from the deliverable 2.1 that we prepared in the working group too. So you can have, a, there is a big report on all these aspects on the accuracy, temporal resolution and vertical resolution of each product that you can find on the probe website. But if we go click quickly, um, we can go to the temperature profile. We can say that we are able to provide products with uh, an accuracy of 0.2 to 2 Kelvin for the passive instruments, but only up to two kilometer or four kilometer maximum for this instrument, whereas the Raman LiDAR is able, is able to provide um, um, a temperature profile which, with an accuracy of 0.5 Kelvin up to five kilometer. And then, up to uh, 5, 10 kilometers, uh, the, the accuracy is around 1.5 Kelvin. For the temporal resolutions of um, temperature profile, it's five minutes. It will be exactly the same as humidity profile for all the instruments, except for the dial, where we need a um, uh, longer averaging time uh, of around 20 minutes for the humidity products. For the vertical resolution, if I focus only on the temperature, um, we have um, 100, which for the passive instruments, you are roughly in few hundreds of meters uh, below two kilometer, whereas above two kilometer altitude, we would more say that we are around more than one kilometer um, vertical resolution, which is much uh, lower than the Raman LiDAR can do with a vertical resolution of 10 to 100 meters. And I just have to say that the vertical resolution of passive instruments really depends on the retrieval algorithms that you use first. And secondly, the method that we use to infer this vertical resolution is not that as direct as we can have with the active instruments. So these numbers are just an approximation. And uh, these, now, these numbers um, do not show that the infrared spectrometer has an, a better vertical resolution, but in fact, it is the infrared spectrometer should give better, uh, more resolved profile than the microwave. Um, and if I switch to the humidity profile, you can expect uh, a humidity profile with an accuracy of 0.2 to 1.5 gram per kilogram with a passive instrument, whereas you are below one for the dial. So you are more between 0.1 and 0.8 gram per kilogram in Centaity. And for the Raman LiDAR, I'm sorry for the different units, but it's around five to 10% of the absolute values. Uh, and for the humidity profile vertical resolution, you can see again that you have a much coarser resolution, of course, with the passive instrument. So we are around, uh, five, I would say, 500 meter to one kilometer below one kilometer altitude for the passive instruments. And above one kilometer altitude, we are closer to a, a vertical resolution of uh, more than one kilometer, whereas the dial and one man LiDAR can provide um, measurements with a resolution of 10 to 100 meters. So depending on what you are interested in, uh, you can see that you will have different uh, vertical resolution accuracy, but also no information inside cloud, or maybe you want cloud. And so it really depends on your application. So now I will just try to quickly show some uh, application and products. So this is the kind of products you could have. So you can have continuous time series of vertic or vertical temperature profiles. So this is an example with the microwave radiometers. So for several days, continuous day, you can see the high temporal resolution of the instruments, but we can clearly see this uh, nighttime radiative cooling here um, um, where, and, and the warming during the day. And you can, of course, uh, use the information from the direct uh, vertical profiles of temperature. So here is an example where the radio suns are in black and the microwave radiometer profiles are in color. So you can see the very good agreement between the products we are um, retrieving and the in-situ uh, profiling. 
So once you have this temperature profile, you can do a lot of applications. So the first one would be to work on the atmospheric stability, which is the vertical gradient, in fact, in the temperature in the lowest levels. And this atmospheric stability is very useful for air quality. So here in this figure, you can see how the increase in atmospheric stability during, different, uh, different, during several days of stable uh, boundary layer condition is linked to an increase in PM10 concentrations. This atmospheric stability is almost interesting for offshore wind energy because it can impact stubborn uh, wakes. So there was an ongoing evaluation inside PROG of the microwave radiometer retrieved atmospheric stability against radio sounds. I can see here that we have a very good agreement between the stability provided by microwave and radio sounds. Another aspect is, of course, when you have this continuous profile, you can really focus on process studies, whatever the application you want. Here, I'm just focusing on fog because this is my area of expertise, but this is just an illustration. You can also use this continuous information as um, not only vertical gradient, but also temperature profile gradients. And here in this example, I wanted to understand why there was a very thick fog in a specific French site, whereas there was no fog in, a, in another campaign site, um, whereas the synoptic conditions were exactly the same. So thanks to the high temporal resolution of the instrument, the microwave here, I could compute the temporal gradient of vertical pro profile within 30 minutes. And I could identify that the site with fog occurrence um, has, uh, was demonstrating a pre fog cooling much larger here compared to the other sites. So with a pre fog cooling two hours before the fog up to one Kelvin in 30 minutes, which was very, very uh, smaller in the other site, explaining the fog occurrence uh, in these sites. So you can reuse all this amount of information for different application if you are interested in atmospheric process studies in general. And of course, the last application of the temperature profiling is data assimilation. And there are many more examples. A lot of national weather services are uh, working on this, like Meteo Suisse and the DWD. But here, it's just a fast illustration of preliminary results. So we have led a campaign in 20, um, 2019 for FOG, and we were able to deploy um, eight microwave radiometers in six different sites. And here you can see on the right figures the impact in the uh, initial state of the model. So how you modify the initial state when you assimilate microwave radiometer temperature profiles. Uh, this was the case of a false alarm in the southwest of France. So you can see that you definitely have uh, a large warming of the atmosphere uh, during this case if you can assimilate uh, the microwave radiometer information. The second product we are discussing is the humidity profile. So here it's again, you will have the same kind of products and temperature. So you will have time series of profiles of water vapor mixing ratio with vertical and temporal resolution depending on the instrument. So I like this figure on the left because you can see uh, dial, Raman LiDAR, and the infrared spectrometer uh, humidity retrieval. So you'll see they are very in good agreement between each other, but they will have different vertical uh, range or uh, or um, accuracy. Uh, you, we, can, we also provide, in general, time series of integrated water vapor. So this is more for the microwave radiometer. And I assume the Raman LiDAR can do it, maybe. But the microwave radiometer is really a, a very accurate measurement of the total colon water vapor uh, integrated. And if you have information for temperature information together with humidity, you could also have access to time series and vertical profiles of relative humidity that is sometimes easier to, um, to understand to detect saturated layers in the atmosphere. And so these humidity profiles, they will have the same application a bit as temperature. So I'm just uh, trying to highlight some of them. So we can also have data assimilation of the humidity profile. This has been done by Metro Suisse, for example, on the left figures, where you can see the impact of assimilated uh, LiDAR observations on the forecasted probability of the 24-hour accumulated precipitation to exceed uh, the threshold, threshold of one millimeter. And the real observation uh, is in uh, showing this excess uh, of, of uh, precipitation is shown with the dots. And you can see the impact of the LIDARs to, to modify the structure of the precipitation. And when you have sites with a long time series, you can start to look at climate sciences like these studies 
who investigated the water vapor trend uh, in, uh, in Payam. Uh, last thing, you can combine the instruments to provide forecast indices. I think it's important for forecasters. So uh, this is just a few illustration of how we can derive CAPE indices uh, with very valuable information before thunderstorms and how we can improve the products you are using by using the instrumental synergy, combining satellite data, dial data, and microwave regimental observations. And the last application, if you are a satellite, uh, if you are in the satellite community, is that we are uh, we can use these ground-based measurements and products for level two satellite data, level two monitorings or calval activities. And this is an example of uh, how we manage to uh, intercompare YASI temperature profiles and integrated water vapor profile together. So um, I think I was too long, so I will uh, give the, um, the ball now to the, to the next presentation about wind turbulence and gas product directly. And you can ask me your question on the pad. I will answer on the pad and I can answer some of them at the end of the presentation. So thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah, thanks a lot, Pauline. I think uh, Simon and now gave me the control over the, the presentation. Let's see quickly if it works. No, yeah, it works. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, my colleagues who uh, assisted me with this presentation by sharing uh, information and uh, figures about their. Uh, retrievals and their products. And now let's start. So quick motivation. Um, in the introduction, we learned that uh, uh, with boundary layer observations, we can close the measurement gap. So this is also uh, within the strategy of the DWD for improvement of the, the weather forecast to actually uh, qualitatively extend the surface-based or the ground-based network with remote sensing instruments. So this roughly uh, divides itself in three categories. One is the technical side of the deployment, so instrument reliability, maintenance, and so the, all these aspects. Then the data quality, which is uh, more or less today's topic. Here we, we have to have a, a quality assured data product that we can actually rely on so that we can, in the end, uh, use these data, so use these information in the numerical weather prediction models to gain a benefit in the forecast. So, and uh, in the end of the DWD's project, uh, uh, this DWD project pilot station, uh, we want to come up with a network recommendation and also with standardized products. So today's topic is wind. So um, starting off with the mean wind, explain a little bit how the, the retrieval works. So in general, we have a lighter centered in the, in the middle. There's a question in the chat. A lighter centered in the in the middle here, and um, we actually project the wind velocity with the lighter, meaning we detect the uh, the backscatter from aerosol or from uh, uh, thin clouds, so to say, so uh, uh, droplet particles onto the line of sight direction, which is basically a geometric problem. But uh, um, with this geometric problem, we haven't accounted for any uh, noise due to the lighter due to the instrument itself. So from this, uh, next, uh, from this, um, we use 30,000 pulses for our mean wind retrieval, and we use four, uh, 24 directions and uh, off the zenith by 15 degrees. So we average around 30 minutes for one mean wind measurement. Um, we are testing hollow streamline systems since 2012, Lear Sphere systems since uh, this year, starting in May. So how do we do this? Basically, with the observation, we get a sine wave, and we fit the, the observed radial velocities to the sine wave to get the wind components from it, as you can see here in this matrix formulation. So then what does the product look like? Um, here we have the, the winds on the left side. And Jason, we see the backscatters. And here we can also see where we can actually retrieve winds with these Doppler lighters, ground-based Doppler lighters. Um, 
uh, once here we see we get a very good return from the cloud layers up here and also from the boundary layers and there's nothing in between. So if we have clear sky conditions, we can basically only get information from the boundary layer, but we benefit from the high return from the clouds to get these information as well. Here you can see it on the right side, uh, the, the aerosol in the boundary layer and then the, the very high signal near the clouds. So how does these results compare to a reference instrument? Uh, as a reference here, we have the radar wind profiler, which is actually an operational instrument. And we see that there's a, a very good correlation between the, the Doppler LiDAR measurements, the winds, and the, the radar wind profiler. And if we actually compare this for a longer time period, we see that these, is, this is, these are in very good agreement, uh, looking at the, the maximum mean difference within the boundary layer and within the free tropospheres. So this is actually a data product that we can use. Moving to a more experimental data product, so it's a turbulence retrieval. Here, uh, I want to point out that we now have only 2,000 pulses that we average, which greatly limits the, the signal strength. So this is actually a, a problem of these kinds of retrievals. And so we cannot rely on basically signal to noise filtering. We have to rely on, um, on more advanced filtering methods. So for the TKE, we have a lot more measurements. So with a, a very um, small step size, which creates a long cycle period. So looking at the equation real quick, uh, there's an approach that my colleague uh, uses uh, from the Smaliko and Banach paper in 2017. And you can actually get the turbulent kinetic energy from the variations of the radial winds that you measure. And if you measure actually at an angle of 35.3 degrees elevation, so this, is, this should be the elevation angle, you get, uh, um, uh, you get the TKE directly from it. And there are two correction terms. One is we have to account for the spatial averaging since um, uh, with the LiDAR, uh, they call it pencil beams, but it's still a volume measurement. So uh, the pulse has a finite duration. And so we, uh, we actually uh, integrate, uh, we actually receive signals from uh, uh, inside a, a measurement bin. So within the pulse length. And then we also have to account for the instrument noise. And quick comparison, if we just do the uh, the, the basic retrieval, just to looking at the radial wind variances, we actually underestimate the, the total and kinetic energies. So if we account for the corrections, so the, the averaging along the line of sight, we actually get a very good agreement with the sonic anemometer. This is at uh, 90 meters from the Falkenberg uh, site near Lindenburg. And uh, my colleague also put together a little uh, product that you can actually directly compare compare the Doppler wind retrieved kinetic energies with the ones uh, from the models. Here's three different models, the ICAN D2, ICAN EU, and ICAN models. And you can see that there are some discrepancies uh, from the actual measurements to the model. So there is, if we were to uh, include these measurements into the model or improve the parameterization of the model, there's room for improvement here because we see that the, the data show a somewhat different structure than the, uh, <clears throat> uh, than the model data. So the little cousin of the turbulence is the vertical velocity statistics. I wanted to include this because um, it's also interesting to look at, look at these uh, quantities because they are important for the convective boundary layer and for stability in the atmosphere. Here we now again have more pulses to average, but we have to keep in mind that we have to have a rather continuous of very frequent stair measurements. So we actually look 90 degrees up. So uh, looking at the statistics, we actually look at the higher moments. So the first moment is the mean, then the second moment is the variance and so on, the skewness and the kurtosis. Actually, the, the second moment is related to the turbulent dissipation of energy that you can nicely see here during a, day's, uh, a, day's cha a day changing during the con convective phase of the day. We have uh, high dissipation rates, uh, which are related to convective up and down movements within the atmosphere. Then skewness and kurtosis are also important uh, for the convective boundary layer because um, uh, we have to include these higher moment statistics to actually um, gain or account for the 
the deviation from the Gaussian shape that we would have without any convection in it. Um, so here you have to keep in mind that if your system has a certain type of noise, and we sometimes encounter noise around the zero meter per second, this can actually be an issue if you want to retrieve vertical velocity statistics. So the lax product is the, the gusts, which uh, probably uh, some of you have experienced uh, yesterday or today with the, with the high wind speeds. This is a similar scan to the, to the turbulent retrieval scan. So you can see we only have a few pulses, a little more than for the turbulence. We now have 3,000 pulses per, per direction to average. And we have roughly 11 directions uh, per cycle. Here we have to scan very fast to actually get the gas information and not uh, average this out. So we only get the mean winds from it. And what you, what you essentially do, you, um, you, you cycle very fast and then uh, you compare the measurement from each cycle to the measurement of half an hour or 10 minutes. So to the measurement of the mean speed to get the, uh, get the gusts from it as a deviation from this mean. How does this look like? You can see uh, the wind speeds at 90, roughly 90 meters, which is comparison uh, between the sonic and the Doppler LiDAR retrieval. In the solid line, you see the, the mean winds that you get from the, uh, from the sonic in blue and the red, the Doppler LiDAR. And in the blue, uh, in the red dots and, the, um, and the, the upper blue line, you can nicely see that the wind gusts that you would retrieve with the sonic anemometer actually nicely coincide with those that we can, we can retrieve from the Doppler LiDARs. Uh, looking at this on a different plot, we see that the, the wind speeds and the, the, and the gusts on the left side and the wind speeds on the right side, we see that the, the wind gusts nicely align with the sonic anemometer's wind gusts. But um, as the winds increase, we also get a slight uh, uh, we, we slightly overestimate the wind gusts with the Doppler wind lighter, which also is related to uh, to the volume measurement that we take compared to the to the point measurement of the sonic anemometer. Um, now, the, for the uh, having discussed or having showed you the retrievals that are possible with the Doppler wind lighters that we are currently testing, I wanted to uh, show you how how far we are currently. So we have a a Python package, so a Doppler LiDAR client, so to say, that um, takes measurements from the Halo Streamline or the Lear Sphere uh, Doppler LiDARs and uh, outputs um, mean winds in level two and level uh, level one and level two net CDF plus some quick looks. So this is the, the current state. We have a reliable mean wind retrieval that we actually use operationally or in near real time. And in the future, we would like to implement the vertical velocity statistics, as well as the turbulent and the wind gusts, once these retrievals are mature enough. And, and, uh, and also um, having a possibility for, uh, um, uh, for scientists or for other organizations to actually look at the raw data more closely. For this, we uh, want to sh I want to show you, share you a little bit our current activities. We have, first of all, there's the long-term assessment of these instruments that I showed you a little glimpse of. And then there's also cross-validation because this year we had the, the great chance of comparing eight supposedly very similar systems side by side. So this is quite promising. We'll see what this she will turn out of. And um, uh, uh, to finish off, I want to share the current status of the Doppler wind lighter where you would actually range this on the technical readiness and benefit for data assimilation scale. Um, regarding the mean wind product, we think that the Doppler wind lighter is, is quite ready for data assimilation, but we haven't done any impact studies so far. And this is all, this nicely ties to the, to the goals of HumanNet and Actress and Pro. If you look at the products individually, we see that the mean wind is quite mature and the others are in quasi-operational phase. So we have quick looks, we have uh, more or less a uh, retrieval that's uh, that's uh, uh, continuously running, but we are uh, we are not sure about the data assimilation. So how would we assimilate gusts or, or uh, turbulence, for example? So uh, our future plans is to implement the the remaining products into the to the client software. 
conduct assimilation studies. And then also, which I haven't talked about, use the backscatter information more. So actually within the framework of Actress, we will use the backscatter information to uh, create products from this as well. So thank you for your attention and for questions in the pad or just write me an email. So in fact, we have some time for a few questions and there were some in the pad. So maybe we'll start with the first one about a question from Nico Cimini. Uh, so thanks much, for the, thanks much for the nice presentation. And could you say a word about the pro and con between um, uh, Doppler wind uh, LiDAR and radar wind profiler? I think I agree so well. One, one may need, to, uh, need other criteria to choose which one should buy to fit the applications. Could you say a word about that? Well, the, the Doppler wind lighter is much cheaper than the radar wind profiler, and it takes much less space. So this Doppler wind lighter is uh, it it fits on a small table currently. The the ones from Halo Streamlines, uh, the ones from Neosphere are heavier, but they are quite compact compared to the radar wind profiler. That's the first. It's one part of the question. Then the second question is they are much cheaper to to get. Um, the disadvantage of the lighter compared to the wind profiler is that you don't have uh, uh, that you have reduced uh, data availability if you look up into the atmosphere. But then again, we are interested mainly in boundary layer winds here in these projects. And uh, here, the Doppler LiDAR is actually somewhat of an advantage because it's uh, it has a, a much shorter pulse length than the radar wind profiler. I mean, there are smaller radar wind profilers, but uh, these also have disadvantages down uh, <clears throat> Uh, near the ground. So this is uh, the Doppler LiDAR is an instrument for the boundary layer, even though you can also get the very good winds from optically thin clouds up in the troposphere. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, yeah I Next. think so. So there, there are many questions and um, so um, I will maybe only choose one. So the second one um, uh, with Henry, can Doppler wind LiDAR be operated at generally pristine sites? Is there a minimum concentration backscatter thresholds for aerosols to allow detection of wind speeds? Um, well, the, the ones who operate Doppler LiDARs in the Arctic might have this problem, or, uh, or we, we see that the, the data availability um, drops or the, the backscatter uh, that we receive drops after a rainfall when this uh, the atmosphere is washed clean out of aerosol. Yeah, there's definitely an effect. But here we, um, we choose not to rely on the signal to noise ratio alone as a filter criterion for, for the data. Uh, we actually use a consensus average that's also operationally used in the radar wind profilers of the DWD, which uh, basically picks the most likely value of uh, the radial velocity, not the, the one with the best signal, but the, the most frequent value. Yeah. OK, so th thanks. Thank you very much. I think there are a lot of questions, but I don't want to delay too much the other presentation. So please, could you connect to the pad and answer yeah, I will. them? And if we have time after the session, of course, we can go again to all the questions with everyone. So uh, thanks again, Marcus, for this, this very nice uh, overview of the wind profile uh, products. And now let's switch to the aerosol profiling with Hugo. Hello, sorry, yes, I'm, I'm online. Yes, Hugo Ricketts here. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit about aerosol profiling and some of the more recent retrievals and applications that have been published or are being published, in fact. So, um, so yes, I, I, I guess most of you probably know what aerosol is, but I'll, I'll just cover it anyway. Uh, and then uh, a little introduction about the different LIDARs that I'm going to show. And these are the different applications. So there's four different uh, topics that I wanted to cover, air quality, pollen, volcanic aerosol and forest fires. So what is aerosol? Well, I guess most of you know, but for those that don't, uh, liquid or solid particles suspended in the atmosphere. So they come in many different shapes and sizes, all the way from the nanometer scale, which are very small sort of, let's say mainly spherical aerosols like these ones. This is not the scale by the way, um, and large sort of raindrops, they also count as aerosol. 
Now, what I'm going to focus on in this presentation is not necessarily spherical drops. They're, they're very common. And in fact, most smog events that you may see are generally spherical drops. I'm going to concentrate on the slightly less spherical things. For example, here we have a picture of some Saharan dust, which was picked up in the UK in an event I'll talk about at the end. But you can see from the scale at the bottom that these particles can vary in size from a few microns to maybe even tens of microns. Other sorts of aerosol you can get is, for example, wildfire particles. And you can see that these sorts of, these sorts of um, aerosol are actually quite complicated. You can have very small ones, a few hundred nanometers, or indeed they can aggregate into really big particles. So in the top left one here is 18 microns across. That doesn't sound big, but for an aerosol particle, that is pretty big. And then just another picture of some pollen, for example. So uh, by the way, uh, links to all of these studies I will put in the pad at the end of the presentation. So you can look at them all if you want to. But you can see that pollen um, can either come in weird sort of uh, irregular shapes or slightly spherical shapes, and that will be relevant later. So LIDAR, you've already seen some plots from LIDARs and how they work, and it's effectively a laser beam that points up or across and uh, reflects off whatever's there. So in our case, we're interested in aerosol. So a standard backscatter LIDAR, which is uh, good for recording things like cloud base, um, is where you have send the light out and you look at and see what comes back, backscatter. But you can get more complicated LIDAR systems, for example, Raman LIDARs. Now, Pauline already mentioned Raman LIDARs in measuring water vapor, but you can also use them to measure aerosol. Uh, the other sort of LIDAR, which is quite interesting and reasonably new topic, is fluorescence LIDAR, uh, which means that you can uh, shine something on an aerosol particle, a light beam, and it will fluoresce, so it will get slightly different wavelengths coming back. And from that, you can start distinguishing what sort of aerosol it is. But the main one I'm going to focus on is depolarization LIDAR. So the idea here is that you have a laser beam. So if you imagine the laser beam is only going in one direction, so up and down, when it hits the particles, uh, if they're spherical, it slightly changes how the laser beam is, is uh, um, polarized, but not very much. But if it hits irregularly shaped particles, like the ones I've just shown, it changes the polarization a lot. And so that is the depolarization ratio. So it means if you have a high depolarization, the particles are irregularly shaped. And if you have a low one, they're more spherical. So that's an interesting property you can use to determine what's going on. All right, so we'll start with uh, number one, air quality. So Henri, uh, who is on the call, uh, his study here um, it was looking at air quality during the COVID-19 lockdown. Now, I imagine most of you have experienced a COVID-19 lockdown uh, in Italy. They had theirs between the middle of March and the middle of April, the strictest level of lockdown when everyone was told to stay at home. So how did that change the air quality? So uh, if you look at the table on the bottom left, you can see that the NO2 dropped quite dramatically down by 60%. But if you look at the PM, so the particulate matter, uh, the, the particles greater than 10 microns, PM10, fell a little bit, but the particles greater than 2.5 microns, PM2.5, actually increased. And you think, well, hang on, all these people staying at home, a lot less air pollution. But if you look at the, um, the second plot where it says first lockdown spring, this is a LIDAR profile of PM, and you can see that there's significantly more PM compared to previous years. So this, the reason for this is that we had easterly winds. So uh, there's a lot more in Henri's paper, which I will put the link to in the pad. Um, but you can see that in the Po Basin, the area in the map at the top, uh, if you have easterly winds, you're blowing all the pollution from the Po Basin up the valley, and therefore you're actually importing a lot of air resources. Very difficult to disentangle, but the the uh, LIDAR information actually helps us quite a lot here to work out where the pollution is coming from and 
and uh, how it's affecting the local air pollution. As I say, there's a lot more to this paper. I've just tried to summarize it in one, one slide. Uh, so for the second thing I wanted to show you is uh, Stefanie Bollmann at FMI in uh, Finland. So this is her study on pollen. So you've already seen the image of pollen that uh, uh, I showed at the start. And so you can see that there are two different types of pollen in this picture. Uh, spruce pollen, which are these strange heart-shaped particles. And then there's the more slightly spherical birch pollen. So they had up, on, up at their site, a poly XT LIDAR, which was a Raman LIDAR, and depolarization LIDAR, and a Doppler LIDAR, which Marcus has just shown us uh, data from a Doppler LIDAR. Now, the interesting part here is because, as I said before, more spherical shape, less depolarization, less spherical shape, more depolarization. So the spruce particles should depolarize more. Uh, so you have LIDAR data, you have uh, pollen measurements from your particle, for, from your air sampler, and then if you put the two together, you can see here uh, some LIDAR plots. So if I take your attention to the very top one, you can see this is a level of how much pollen there was. Um, the next one down shows you how much aerosol there was in the atmosphere. So you can see here this goes from zero to five kilometers, and it's four days long. So you can actually see on the last day, there's a lot of red coloring. This means there's a lot of aerosol in the atmosphere. And if you go down another couple of slides, so the fourth one down, this is the depolarization ratio again. Ah, thank you. Someone's got the pointer. <laughs> um, uh, and this indicates that there are a lot of non-spherical particles. And what you can actually see is that the, if I go to the next slide, um, this is, a uh, again, from the ACP paper, uh, a plot of how much um, spruce pollen there is compared to the total pollen population. And when it's yellow, there's not very much spruce, which is this irregularly heart-shaped one. But when there's more, the, the bluer colors, there is more. I, uh, I like this mouse movement. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and so the idea here is that you can actually determine which pollen is, is there from the LIDAR data. So again, a lot more information in, in Stephanie's paper. And then my third topic I wanted to cover was volcanic aerosol. Now, I admit this isn't strictly within the boundary layer, but it's, uh, yes, it's easier to get data from the stratosphere, lower stratosphere. So we've gone quite high up now. We're now uh, almost uh, 15 kilometers above the ground, which I admit is not the boundary layer. However, um, two years ago, roughly, on the 22nd of June, 2019, there was a very big volcanic eruption in the Kuril Islands. You can see the Red Cross marks. It's just off the coast of Russia, and it emitted a lot of ash. And you can see this picture from the International Space Station on the right, uh, showing a very big cloud of ash and SO2 uh, being emitted into the upper atmosphere. So there's a study by Martin Osborne, um, uh, which is currently in a preprint in ACP. And the way I've marked with the red circles, you can see the this volcanic ash layer. So this is very high at this stage. We're talking about 12, 13 kilometers. And in the sort of, this is where the, the, the Raman data can be a bit tricky to see and the depolarization ratio is high. So this indicates that the particles are irregularly shaped. So this is picking up some of the ash. And then there was another study which I was involved in. So the only thing really to take away from this is that the, uh, bot the plots start from the eruption on the 22nd of June, where the red line is, and they go through to the following year. So we're seeing data for a whole year, and actually this cloud remained up there. Now, it wasn't necessarily ash. It was also sulfuric acid droplets, which formed from the SO2. And uh, from the bottom plot, you can see where the green crosses are. The layer actually got up to about 20, 21 kilometers. So it's a very, very high layer. And once stuff's up in the stratosphere up there, it stays there for a very long time. But it's just a way to show that you can determine, because uh, the sulfuric acids is a spherical droplet, 
and the ash is irregularly shaped, you can distinguish between the two. Um, again, you can have a look at our paper on that. And then the final thing I wanted to cover is some work I've been working on more recently. Uh, we had a, um, in the UK, we had some aerosol layers that came over from, or came up, I suppose, from uh, the Iberian Peninsula uh, and the Sahara. And this was on the 16th of October. And it was very dramatic because I took this picture of midday and the sun was a completely red color. But we had, it was very strange at the time, is it Saharan dust? That was what the media was saying. Um, but there's a strong suspicion that there was also some forest fire smoke. So if I show you the image here, this is a satellite image from the day and you can see cloud in yellow and blue, but where you see this sort of murky, I guess, brownish color, uh, layer one is a sort of thinner uh, Saharan dust layer whereas layer two is a much, much thicker, optically thick layer. And we think that this was a combination of Saharan dust and forest fire smoke from Portugal. Now, this is a plot that probably needs a bit of explaining. Uh, so we have a blue color at the, and a pink salmon color. Pink salmon color is a radar data, which detects big particles and blue is LIDAR data, which detects small particles. And what you can see is that they're not the same. And what that means is that there are big particles that have fallen out of the atmosphere and small particles which have stayed in the atmosphere. So this means, this, so this is a, a plot of looking straight up from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon. And you can see that that means that the bigger particles are falling out of the layer. So there's a lot more research that I'm doing on this and we have a lot more data to look at, um, but I just wanted to show you that and uh, just very quickly show you how we've used uh, the, uh, the Silometer network in the UK to measure the arrival of this ash cloud and the departure. So if you look back at the presentation uh, <laughs> in the recording, then you'll get a lot more from this, but basically, um, uh, the purple colors show that it arrives at four in the morning on the left plot and the, the yellow colors indicate when it arrived over the east of England and on the right hand plot it shows you when it departed again so we could actually track the layer as it arrived and departed over the UK and that's using using lidars as well I think on the last slide I just wanted to show you some more depolarization measurements this is a paper which got accepted today so very exciting um, uh, and uh, so just what I wanted to point out on the bottom plot is we have some green colors on the left-hand side, which is the Saharan dust. And you can see a very thick layer up to four kilometers of Saharan dust. And then on the marked uh, Roman numeral five V, we have this, this sloped layer of smoke. And the interesting part was that the LIDAR could not penetrate it. It was so thick that the LIDAR was absorbed by it, uh, the, the laser light was absorbed by it. So that means that that makes it very tricky to do uh, retrievals. But uh, if you have a look at our paper, you can see more uh, on that. OK, that's it. Thank you for listening. Uh, the uh, I'll put some links to the data and the papers in the pad. Uh, and I'll probably take questions at the end, seeing as I think I've overrun slightly. Thanks, thanks a lot, Hugo, for this uh, very nice talk again. We have a very nice presentation since the beginning, very complete. Uh, yeah, we are a bit late, but there is only one question at the moment, so I will try to take it, and maybe you can answer quickly and uh, go more in details in the pad. Um, Henri just wanted to know if there is any quantitative comparison of depolarization ratio between the low-cost systems, like Vaisala, Simel, uh, versus the research depolarization lidars. So I think um, the the uh, the CIMEL, I, I I am aware that there is a depolarization. We're, we're actually in the process of purchasing one for our research site. Um, I haven't seen any any studies directly on the comparison with the uh, research systems, and the Visala one I believe is very new. So I don't. I don't think I have any data on, I haven't seen any data on depolarization data from Vaisala systems. 
But yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I in one, in one is just saying on the pad that there's, there is for Vaisala, but not published yet. So maybe ah, right. Okay, we'll that's fine. Out. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll find out. out. Yeah, so we should find out very soon, I assume. Um, so yeah, we move. I think it's time for to move to the next uh, presentation, and of course, we will have a few minutes of question just at the end. So I think we will give the ball to Ivona because this is not on the main presentation, right? So we sh will she will share her screen, right? Yes, I'm trying to share it. Okay, great. So my name is Ivona Stachleska. I am working at the University of Warsaw Faculty of Physics, and. Um, uh, topic that I would like to discuss today is the discrimination of the aerosol cloud and precipitation using um, synergy of different instrumentation. So to start, I would like to indicate a little bit on the motivation. Um, first of all, that uh, yeah, from the point of view that aerosol, cloud and radiation are strictly connected to the dynamic processes in the atmosphere and then the aerosol and cloud um, interaction cannot be understood without uh, understanding also of the dynamic processes. And to do that, the information about the cloud and aerosol and um, molecules in the atmosphere is uh, extremely important. If we don't have a good classification scheme that is separating um, in a fine scale on a near real time uh, the different atmospheric um, scatters, it is difficult to make um, any other assessments which are related also to the radiative budget um, simulations and to input of this information into the radiative transfer models. So um, I wanted to show some results of a campaign that was funded by European Space Agency in the framework of the Polymos, uh, Polish radar and uh, LADAR mo uh, mobile observation system. Uh, in the frame of this project, we developed a mobile high power multi wavelength thermal polarization LIDAR, and also we deployed a low cost compact size cloud radar. This is a BASTA radar. And um, we took the measurements with several also additional different remote and in situ sensors at the ground and use also the satellite data, for example, from SP5 and SP3 for the data analysis. The idea was to combine this instrumentation for exploring different multi-sensor synergies and also to product, the data, to, to, to product the data that can serve indirectly as an input for the atmosphere ecosystem model. So the model results um, were supposed to enable assessment of the aerosol cloud impact over a pitland site. So everything was happening on this um, Pitland side. And uh, what we need for the combination of uh, LIDAR and the different instruments, um, data, cloud radar, microwave radiometer, for example, we need to uh, first of all have the instruments that are collocated and operating in 24 7 modules. So we have to aim for automatic measurements. It is very important that the high resolution data products from the LIDAR are obtained. So we, in, in this case, we have to rather choose the elastic than inelastic retrievals because of the Raman resolution. Raman resolution for this kind of studies is too low. The signals are too noisy. To reduce signal to noise ratio issue, we have to average a lot in time and also in space. So from that point of view, the simple elastic retrievals are, are better. Then also we have to go rather for a wavelength dependent than single wavelength elastic. Uh, measurements so that we can possibly calculate the color ratio and if we have the color ratio then we can indicate a little bit on the size of the particles. The polarization of the single elastic signal is sufficient. Uh, it can indicate, as uh, Hugo was saying on the previous talk, on the non-sphericity of the particles and it can help in the discrimination. Obviously, if you have wavelength dependent products, it is even better because then you can see whether smaller or bigger particles are depolarizing. So this is quite nice. On the other hand, for as we are specialists um, on the LiDAR systems and not really on the cloud radar or microwave radiometry, um, we decided to use the standard data products from the cloud radar and microwave radiometer and then to focus our 
uh, our main efforts on uh, obtaining as good as possible and improve as much as possible the LiDAR data. So here I wanted to show you two beautiful examples, data at night time at the Rzecin Pitland size. This is a nature 2000 reserve. It's one of the biggest uh, pitlands in uh, Europe. The PI of the site is Bogdan Hojnicki from Poznan University of Life Sciences. So he was giving us a space uh, for putting our um, instrumentation on this site. The measurements were taken uh, for several months in 2018 and several months in 2019. Uh, in both cases, we had a little bit different set of it, the instrumentation. If you are interested, you can contact me and I could show you some more materials on that. Um, however, what is important for this topic is the instruments, following instruments. First of all, the instrument that is developed for European Space Agency, and uh, this development was done by myself, Giorgio Giorgis from Neymetrix, Volker Frank Taller from LMU in Germany, Dirk Schottemeyer and Giorgio Ceremas from ISAS Tech, and Patrick Pochta, who is actually our LiDAR operator, the main pers person for the operation of the LiDAR. Additionally, we were using um, a second instrument developed at Latmos, France by Julian Delanoa and his team. And support uh, from the University of Warsaw was done for, for the data evaluation of this instrument, was done by Dong Seng Yang and from uh, PULS uh, University, Camila Harenda. Third instrument that we used was instrument provided by INOA Romania. Uh, PI of uh, this instrument was Dragosene and the UVU support was given by Wojtek Kumala. So for the observations, I wanted to indicate that um, in general level one products of the elastic polarization LiDAR, when we think about the signal and the depolarization component, uh, the two information that are typically given is the range corrected signal and also the volume depolarization ratio. We saw some of this data also in the uh, uh, presentation. So uh, this, um, these uh, two slots, which I show here for 24 hours of continuous observations using both uh, using, using the LiDAR, show you that uh, the LiDAR is quite sensitive, uh, sensitive to small particles. Um, small droplets, aerosol particles, of course. It can, however, detect the clouds if they are composed of uh, small liquid uh, particles and even small ice crystals. Uh, specifically for cirrus clouds and uh, supercool liquid layers, it can be it can be quite well visible by the, by the LiDAR. So this is something what is provided, these two products, the PR square and the delta product, the volume depolarization and um, range corrected LiDAR signal is something what you can get practically from every single LiDAR, even from a seilometer. Of course, in the case of the seilometer, we know that um, the range, the maximum range of the signals is going to be strongly limited, but uh, any high power aerosol LiDAR that has option of polarization can provide uh, such figures as we, as we uh, show here. On the other hand, we also take into account the level one products of the cloud radar, which is basically the reflectivity and the velocity. And uh, from the figures that I show you for exactly the same day, uh, 10th of July 2019, you can see that the radar in comparison with LiDAR is more sensitive to larger particles, ice, drizzle, that it can penetrate even uh, thicker clouds, uh, liquid water clouds, and that it can observe precipitation. However, if you go back to previous um, to previous figure, you can also see that in terms of um, detection of the cirrus clouds and maybe even uh, mixed phase clouds, um, it's not. Um, um, it, also, it has some limitations. So, for the, uh, if we think about the classic classic classification, classic approaches for the for the classification of different target uh, aerosol cloud uh, precipitation scenarios, which are obtained from only LiDAR or only radar data, you can uh, see in this figure, uh, which I um, show you here, um, that uh, for the LiDAR, uh, LiDAR on the top and the radar on the bottom, you can see that the number of classes is quite limited. 
So basically, in red, you have clouds from the LiDAR. Uh, you have aerosol, non-spherical particles uh, in, in this, um, in this uh, yellow color, aerosol spherical particles in the bluish and then uh, molecular uh, uh, part of the, of the signals is given in blue. Uh, cloud radar uh, obviously doesn't see molecular particles, but it can see the ice particles, drizzle particles, rain, liquid, uh, and, and, and liquid particles. It can also see some aerosol, liquid aerosol, and also, uh, also in the boundary layer. Within the boundary layer, there seem to be some signatures between 9 and uh, 14 hours of, of some uh, rain or drizzle in the lowermost a part of uh, in the boundary layer, which is which is likely due to the insects, um, then to true ray, rain or, or a drizzle. So we can see on these two figures that that single classification from single instrument in both cases, lidar and radar, is limited, and thus of course the combination of these two typing methodologies seem to be a very natural step. And also, Hugo was already showing an example of such a of such a uh, combination. The question is if we can do more than that what was shown by Hugo, and that um, as a simple uh, combination of only these two uh, instruments. So, um, what we wanted to explore is that if we can get additional information from a microwave radiometer if it could help in discriminating, for example, the melting layers or supercooled layers in the atmosphere. And for that, uh, we thought about using a new method for synergy of the three instruments. And that method we based on thresholds, which are applied on data products. The methodology was developed, tested, published. So here I wanted to just indicate some main features of the method. So the LiDAR big scatter signal, which I show you here, I just give you, and also the radar signal for uh, returning firing, I just give you as a reference. We don't need to focus on that. It's just to see that both of them are quite similar because the technique of LiDAR and radar is, is essentially the same. The only difference is the radiation that is um, emitted to the atmosphere. And then if we focus, again, as I said, um, on the LiDAR, retrieval choice, we can see on this figure that the classical approaches, uh, for example, Klet fernat sassano retrieval, are unfortunately for this type of typing not really sufficient. That's why uh, we are using uh, this approach proposed by Holger Bars of the quasi-beta instead. And here is um, an example in the backscatter um, coefficient you can see the differences that you actually have when you are applying simply CLED method with the assumption of the LiDAR ratio, um, and also when you actually apply the quasi-beta method for which you simply have to, before calculating uh, uh, calculating the, um, the signals, you have to come up with the um, range-dependent uh, LiDAR system constant, and then calculate the beta attenuated uh, profile, and then, as you see in this uh, picture, the underestimated retrieval from that method suddenly uh, fits better to the, to the final retrieval. So what is the difference in terms of, because when we look at this figure, it, the difference seems to be like, like really minor, the difference between the blue curve on the second uh, panel and between the, the red curve, um, it's, it's practically negligible. But I wanted to show you how it looks like when we look at the 24-hour section, again, uh, calculated for the same day. But before we do that, I will introduce also the LiDAR products, which we choose. So first of all, as I said, we are going for the quasi-beta. And then how we have to redefine the known in the LiDAR community products of scattering ratio, big scatter color ratio, and depolarization ratio. And if you look at this, um, you can see that basically this quasi-beta is applied to uh, known definitions. So now I will show you what is the difference in terms of the scattering ratio when, you are, when we are using the quasi-beta results to calculate the scattering ratio. So the two upper panels 
the two upper panels are uh, showing you the LIDAR ratio and the backscatter coefficients calculated using a CLET method. As you can see, um, this methodology seems not to work very well, especially within the cloud uh, regimes. And also for the boundary layer, uh, it seems that this backscattering ratio is really not retrieving a proper, a, a, a proper variability uh, that, that is present in the LiDAR signals. So if we look at the two lower panels, this is actually these two lower panels are showing the, also the scattering ratio and also the uh, backscatter, but now this backscatter is shown in terms of this quasi-beta result. Um, so the scattering is calculated with quasi beta and you can see much more variability. You can see that you have, first of all, a better results in the lower range. You see that you are much more sensitive within clouds. You also can see that the matter is able to grasp some drizzle in the cloud. And also you can see that the aerosol signatures are much more visible and they actually, and they actually uh, also higher resolution. And this high resolution, as I said to you, is quite crucial when we want to make a proper um, molecule, aerosol, and cloud typing. So in terms of this color ratio that I mentioned, that is important to have it, not only to have a single wavelength, high power polarization LiDAR, but to have at least two wavelengths, you can see as a demonstration here, in all the three cases, in all these three panels, you have a quasi backscatter quasi beta and you see the results at three different lidar wavelengths the third the second and the uh, first component um, harmonic of the neodymium yak laser and you can simply see that the sensitivity of this three wavelengths is um, different with respect uh, to the particles that are penetrated so the wavelength is different and then the sensitivity is different so in a way from the ratios of these different combinations 1064 with 532 345 with 1064 etc all the combinations we can get some indication on the particle size so at the, at the end the final product that we are using in our uh, retrieval is um, three uh, extremely important informations defined on this beta quasi-beta particle, all of them, and they are separating the target scatter, the target shape, and the target size. And this is the scattering ratio on the top one, quasi-particle depolarization ratio in the middle, and the backscattering color ratio on the top. In this case, I only showed one color ratio, but of course we use, um, we use all of them. So now the new classification scheme is also based on, as I said to you, is based on the thresholds, which are uh, uh, which are defined for free instruments uh, with uh, some final target classes, which are much more um, complicated, let's say, than the proposed one or the ones that you can get from single LIDAR. So at the end, we have the class that is uh, giving you indication on the uh, um, spherical shape of the particles, partly uh, non-spherical particles, fine particles, coarse particles, non-spherical particles, mixed phase clouds, ice clouds, liquid clouds, supercooled layers and boundary layer particles. And for all this um, data, we are using uh, different components that I said to you. So this um, pro data products, um, from cloud radar and microwave radiometry. This is uh, this is the uh, reflectivity and velocity, temperature and relative humidity. So standard products, and then from the lidar, uh, it is uh, it is the quasi beta scattering ratio and color ratio. And then here I put it some of this threshold that um, that we uh, that we are using uh, for the lidar. And uh, I wanted to stop here. Later on, you can think and, and, and assess if you, if, if you agree with the threshold or not. But I wanted to stop a little bit to explain you where from we get this plus minus, plus minus 
uh, plus minus, minus percentage, this this in a way uncertainty or or I don't know how how to call it uh, um, a flag uh, that is related to each of the thresholds because for every single time when we applied a certain threshold, we also applied it uh, for uh, for uh, values which were smaller or higher uh, from the initial threshold, and then uh, we looked it at uh, the variance and uh, and the change of the product dependingly on on this variation of the values and this was uh, letting us to some conclusion that even if we would erroneously guess scattering ratio or in erroneously use the scattering ratio that is uh, that is given here or quasi mix scatter or color ratio um, in fact um, this would not affect much the retrieval and the effect on the retrieval you can see here as a percentage for the Doppler crowd, cloud yeah. cover, we... just, just one thing, uh, Ivona, we are running out of time. I don't know if you have a lot of slides or could you do, I don't know how many slides you still have or... So two more we... slides. How many? Two more. two more. Okay, one. I don't know if you can try to go quick just so that we have time for the questions for you and uh, for the other presentations. Can you finish like in one minute more and, and then we end? Yeah. I'm yes. sorry, but it's just to, to have some time for the question. I think it's important. And uh, so maybe I know it's very that. interesting and I know, uh, but I'm trying to, to, to keep on the on the schedule. So I can understand us, but we are maybe wasting the time now. So let's go to the final slide. Yes, thanks. So what I wanted to, to show you is that we can do this derivation for uh, several days. This is, for example, derivation for four days of a certain very interesting case of the Saharan dust event that was injected into, the, the particles were injected to the free troposphere, but also to the boundary layer. You can see the complicated situation and you can see that the motor methodology is working even in a very complicated um, situation. So with that, I can finish, thank you. Yes, thank you, Ivona. So, so sorry for uh, interrupting in, in during the presentation. I know it's never nice, uh, but I think it was a very great presentation, very, very full. Uh, all, all, all this synergetic approach, I think it's very important. And you point, uh, you have shown very interesting prospects for these aerosol and cloud classifications. And um, you already had one question on the pad by uh, Nico. Uh, he wanted to know, but I think you, in fact, ensured at the end but maybe we can say a word of how you use the microwave regimeter with visuals or in the synergistic method. I use these thresholds that are given now on the slide. Uh, I define the different uh, regimes of the, uh, of the particles for super cold ice particles, rain and drizzle in boundary layer and unknown particles in boundary layer. And I set the standard, uh, I, I, uh, I set the, uh, thresholds on the temperature and relative humidity. I don't use uh, the other parameters from the microwave rotimeter. So you have the thresholds here. Thank you. So Thank you. I, I don't know if we have other questions about specifically these presentations. Uh, if some people, uh, I think I've seen someone raising his hand, right? Or I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. So if there is no question, so you can still use uh, the pad for your questions, but maybe we can go back to uh, some question we had a lot, in fact, on the, on some previous presentations. Um, so maybe on the wind and gust presentation for Marcus, even if you answered on the pad, maybe it's nice if we can say that say them orally for everyone and all the audience. So maybe we will pick a few of them. You have many questions, in fact, about the, um, the, the Doppler LiDAR client that you developed. So you had questions about uh, how we can freely uh, take um, and the number of uh, VAD points and elevation angles can be chosen in your client. Um, and also, I think you had a similar questions uh, about uh, for, from E1 about how the client handles uh, different elevation angles. Maybe you can just say a few words about the Doppler LiDAR client. Uh, 
Yeah, um, quickly, the, the client is for the, it's it's not for operating the, the LIDAR, it's for uh, pr uh, for retrieving the product, so level one and level two products from the data that you retrieve from the LIDAR. So you would have to set up the LIDAR yourself. You would just have to tell the client how the LIDAR has been set up and how the data looks. So the client will process this. This is <clears throat> the, the one thing. And the, the other is that, um, there were several questions um, um, regarding, there was one actually um, uh, all the way near the end, the, the asking about the leaders for lighters and their net CDFs. Yes, we uh, currently the, the, the version that's on GitHub, I, uh, I hesitate, I'm hesitant to, to put the current version that we use uh, uh, quasi operationally uh, on GitHub because uh, leaders for wanted to make changes to the software which, because uh, currently we, we, with the VAD scan, we have to uh, concatenate a lot of uh, very small NetCDF files, which can take time if you're not doing it on a server, but on the, on the, on the, smaller, on the smaller computer. And um, here we actually wanted to wait for, for, the, for the next, for the upcoming software updates, which would make it possible to, to uh, to have more, to have a VAD scan within the Leosphere software, so to configure that and uh, to get the complete net CDF from this scan, so that we can process this, this is much easier. So we wanted to wait for that. Um, then another thing is that uh, I'm always happy for for people who want to uh, who want to do DBS retrievals, because we at Lindenberg we focus on the VAD. But I think that the, the client software should include more than uh, than one option for for wind retrievals and DBS is the the most common after the VAD. And um, I'm happy to include this. Um, the, the the level two product would be a little different because you you would have to choose uh, a height vector or a height distribution in advance because you this requires interpolation between the heights. And um, I'm happy if, if someone actually uses the DBS to include this, because we won't likely test it very much at Lindenberg. Because if there's someone who wants to test this and use this, just contact me. Um, more questions regarding this? Um, yeah, generally you can put any any uh, if you any configuration even DVS you can create a level one net CDF file daily level one level one net CDF file that's not an issue you can do that. Oh. Yeah, I, and maybe you can say one word uh, because you had two questions about turbulence measurements um, to see if they have been uh, compared with turbulence tower measurements and if you have tested the TK, TKE determination in urban settings, maybe we can just end with these two questions. Mm. Um, yes, the TKE, we haven't tested it. So this is part of uh, Eileen Peschke's current, uh, current work. We haven't tested this in, uh, in an urban setting, um, but we compared it to the tower. So there's a, a 99 meter mast in Lin uh, at Falkenberg, which has uh, uh, eddy covariance systems on several levels, and uh, she compared this to to this tower measurement. And the, the graphic that I showed was actually comparison from the Doppler lidar with this mast, uh, but we haven't tested this in uh, in an urban environment yet. Okay. Uh, but it, it's it's actually not in the turbulence retrieval is not yet included also in the client. So keep in mind. Yeah. Okay. So thanks a lot, Marcus. You have really had a lot of questions, <laughs> but yeah. you, answered, you answered a lot of them on the pad. I just tried to pick some of them so that we can have a, an oral discussion. Um, I had, in fact, one question. Maybe I was not um, clear enough, enough, so I can say a word about yeah. How good was the remotely sensed temperature profile I presented to ground observation? So just to remind you, we'll have my presentation on the probe website. And uh, there is this slide I prepared where I put the accuracy, expected accuracy of the instruments. And in fact, in general, it comes from a literature review of different papers, which have been comparing the, the retrieval of uh, microwave regimeter or Raman LIDAR for 
against radio zones or tower measurements. So this is the accuracy that we expect in general from in situ comparison. So I just um, try to be more clear saying that for passive instruments, the accuracy depends on the altitude because it depends on their weighting functions. And uh, they have broader weighting function in the highest altitude uh, gates. So they have in general an accuracy which is degraded uh, above the boundary layer, so above two kilometers. So uh, to just summarize briefly for temperature profiles, you can expect uh, a temperature retrieval with an accuracy of 0 0.2 Kelvin to 1.5 Kelvin with passive instrument inside the boundary layer. And uh, with Raman LiDAR, with, you can get an accuracy of uh, be a better accuracy of around 0 0.5 Kelvin. But uh, I have been said it was with an averaging time of 30 minutes. So again, all these numbers and comparison of numbers, it's hard. It depends on the instrument. It depends for the active instruments, the averaging time. Uh, whereas the passive, it's always uh, the same temporal resolution, so a few minutes. But they have for the passive different accuracy depending on the altitude, whereas the active instruments have the same accuracy. Very complicated, but you can refer to, to the presentation if you need more information. But uh, yeah, these numbers were against in situ uh, measurements. And for Ivona, um, Pablo wanted that, uh, was asking if you could share the publication link from the slide of new classification. He's referring to Wang et al. 2020. So, I probably missed this one, or maybe you know what it is. If you could put the link in the pad, that would be nice. If I understood well the questions, I'm not so sure, but I think this is the question. Um, and after that, I think we, we, we can, I think we have answered uh, quite a lot of questions. Uh, nobody is typing any more question, I think. Nobody is raising his hands. You can do it if you want, just a few minutes late, but. Um, if nobody wants to ask anything, I would like to thank all the uh, presentations, the, uh, the, the people who prepared the presentation and all the contributions because they were, it's, it's a very hard work, I think, to synthesize in uh, such a short time so many applications, so it takes time and I would like to thank them for the time they dedicated to the session, uh, thank to all of you for joining the sessions. Um, and uh, and uh, thanks to everyone. And I can just wish you a very good weekend now. And don't forget to look at the probe website and YouTube channels. If you missed some of the presentation, everything is recorded. So it's a very, very good uh, way to, to also um, um, uh, share the information with some colleagues in your institute so they can access all the presentations. So thanks to everyone. And I will close the meeting now. And I wish all of you a very good weekend. Thank you.